this is an overview lecture on DNA replication. As I stated in class, most of what you're going to hear, this is a review for you. You've heard before. And so, uh, uh, but what we need to focus on is really the application uh, process of this learning. The learning objectives are as follows, that at the end of this session, you'll be able to articulate uh, how the search for the monarchy of inheritance was, uh, why DNA was an unlikely candidate to be the molecule of inheritance, uh, sort of uh, articulate Griffiths, Avery, McCarty, McLeod, and Hershey and Chase experiments and how critical they were in uh, proving to the scientific community and to the whole world that DNA is the molecule of inheritance, and then articulate the roles of Charkov, Franklin, and uh, Watson and Craig and Linus Pauling in the discovery of the structure of DNA. This is going to be the first part of this lecture. And so, for many years, people realized, since, since the days of Menlo, people realized that uh, uh, heritage was passed on from generation to generation. They just did not know what the molecule was that was involved. They knew that it had to be a molecule that was uh, that had the capability of being replicated and passed on from generation to generation and carried traits with. Uh, Frederick, who was a Swiss chemist, recognized early on, and he discovered what he called the nucleon. Uh, and this was a molecule that was found in the nucleus and he thought that it would be a good candidate as the molecule of inheritance and this molecule had carbon, hydrogen, uh, phosphate, oxygen and of course nitrogen. Frederick Griffith was probably the first one that did an experiment that kind of began to uh, lead folks uh, on, uh, on focusing on the molecule of inheritance uh, and its ability to uh, pass on from generation to generation. What Dr. Griffith did was he worked with uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae and he found that there were two different strains. One of these was smooth and the other one was rough. And the smooth one had the lipopolysaccharide capsule while the rough looking uh, strain did not have these caps. He found that if he were to take the smooth colony and injected it into mice, the mouse will die. If he took the rough colony and injected it into, uh, into a mouse, the mouse will live. And then he did another experiment, and that is if he were to subject the uh, virulent or the infective uh, uh, smooth strain to heat and kill it and then he would inject that into the mouse that the mouse will survive so whatever that uh, factor was that was responsible for killing the mice uh, it was sensitive to heat and then he did a very critical very ingenious experiment and that is that he would take the uh, heat killed smooth and mix it with living or strain, rough strain. And when he injected that mixture into mice, the mice died. And when he isolated uh, uh, and cultured the bacteria from the tissue of the mice that had died, he discovered that uh, the living rough strain had been transformed or changed to the smooth strain. And so his conclusion was that the virulent substance is in the uh, smooth strain, and that is the and that the transforming principle uh, was passed from the uh, smooth strain to the uh, rough strain, and was able to transform the rough strain to become uh, uh, virulent, like the smooth strain. And then 
this is where his uh, greatest work stopped. But then uh, a group of three individuals, Avery, McCarty, and McLeod, at uh, Rockefeller University kind of took over and simplified that experiment that Griffith carried out. What they did was they took the smooth strain of Streptococcus pneumoniae and they subjected it to heat to kill it. And then they isolated the extract from this. And then they took the rough bacterium and they sprinkle or they mix this homogenate with the rough strain and they saw that they could transform the rough into the smooth colony. They then took that uh, homogenate or filtrate and subjected it to protease to remove all the proteins. And when they mix it with the rough strain, they found that uh, it, it, it still had the ability to transform rough into smooth. And so it was not protein. And when they mix it to ribonuclease to remove the RNA from the uh, extract, and then they mix it with the rough uh, bacteria, and they found that it was still able to transform the rough bacteria into smooth bacteria. So it was not RNA. But when they add, they subjected that uh, uh, filtrate or homogenate to DNA, so deoxyribonuclease to digest the DNA content of that homogenate. And they mix it to the rough uh, uh, bacterium that the ability of that homogenate to transform the rough bacterium had disappeared. So the conclusion then, their final conclusion is this, that DNA is the active factor that was able to transform the rough uh, bacteria into smooth bacteria and cause it to be virulent. So the active principle is DNA. Now, uh, people were still very skeptical uh, the purity of the homogenate. Uh, they just weren't convinced until Hershey and Chase, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, uh, in the early 1950s, uh, they, these two were studying bacteriophage, and these were uh, viruses that infect bacteria. And they were studying the life cycle of the phage, and they found that if they were to infect the bacteria with the virus, that after one generation, that the uh, virus particles would be generated within the bacteria, and then bacteria will lice, and the viral particles will be released. And so, they ask the following question. Since we're working with viruses, and viruses are very simple, what if we decided to do an experiment to prove what the transforming principle is? And they would do that by labeling the DNA with P32 and the protein with S35. Now, and then, so what they did was this. They would take E. coli and infect them with a uh, virus uh, whose DNA was labeled with P32 or whose protein code was labeled with S35. Now, something about virus that you need to know is that it, this is very simple. The core inside the head is DNA and the code outside is really is the protein. So you could separate the two very nicely. So. They label the DNA with P32 and they label the protein with S35. And so they infected the E. coli and at the end they pellet the bacteria and they lyse the bacteria and they begin to look for the radioactivity. And so here's what they did. They did a very simple experiment and that is that they mixed the bacteriophage with the E. coli and then they put it in a wearing blender and they blended at a speed. They press puree and they blend it at a speed that will knock off the viruses. And then they would pellet the bacteria, wash it and rinse it several times. And then they would lyse the bacteria and they would identify uh, whether or not the P32 is inside the bacteria or the S35 was inside the bacteria. And what they found was that if they were to do they label the protein code with S35 and they infect the bacteria, knock off the, bac uh, the, the phage or with the uh, wearing blender 
and then they watched the bacteria and lysed the bacteria and look at what's inside the bacteria. They found that S35 was not present. But what they found, on the other hand, was when they label the core of the bacteriophage with P32, it labels the DNA. And when they infect it, knock off the phage, and they pellet the bacteria, wash and lyse, they found that they were able to identify radioactivity within the E. coli. So this proved once and for all that the molecule of inheritance or the transforming principle was in the DNA. And from this experiment, people were really convinced. Now, what is the structure of DNA? Uh, there were two very famous fellows, uh, James Watson, uh, 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 and uh, uh, Francis Crick. Uh, Watson was an ornithologist from the University of Indiana, 23 years old, was interested in finding out what the structure of this was. And uh, uh, Crick was a uh, uh, physicist at Cambridge. Now, it turns out that two, these two fellows talk a lot. And so James Watson left Indiana and he went to uh, Cambridge and he began to team up with, uh, with Dr. Craig. And uh, they had coffee and they talk a lot and they talk some more. They did very little experimentation. What they were banking on was all the information that had been amassed from the work on a lot of scientists in different countries in different labs. And so they began to examine them. But, uh, there was a group, uh, Dr. Wilkins' group at King's College in London, which was about 75 miles away from Cambridge. And uh, there was a young lady by the name of uh, Rosalind Franklin. Now, this is an X-ray crystallographer. She was working on crystallizing proteins, and she was working on crystallizing uh, 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 DNA as well. And she would look at the crystal structures. Uh, using X-ray diffraction grading and predicting what the structure of these molecules were. Now, her interaction with Watson and Crick was not very good. He thought they were two uh, fellows that had no business in science because they didn't do a whole lot of work and she didn't have a whole lot of respect for them. Uh, Linus Pauling at UC Berkeley was uh, uh, really busy on trying uh, to come up with the uh, structure of DNA. And he is uh, noted for uh, uh, winning the Nobel Prize in, uh, uh, in chemistry, and he also won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Not very many people uh, uh, win multiple uh, Nobel Prizes, but he was, uh, he was famous for doing that. And so he was working about the same time on trying to beat everybody to come up with the structure of DNA. And then there was Hungarian-born scientist at Columbia by the name of Charkov. Charkov was a chemist, and he was a very brilliant, brilliant chemist. Now, on his way to uh, 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 Great Britain, he met with uh, uh, Watson and Crick, and he came up with the following conclusion. These guys are not very good scientists, and they have no business in science. But one day, uh, Watson and Crick decided to propose a model for the DNA and they uh, released it to the public and it was a, uh, not a double helix but triple helix and uh, uh, nobody accepted it. In fact, they had the nitrogen bases oriented to the outside instead of toward the inside and uh, uh, no one accepted it and Cambridge kind of banned them from ever releasing any, uh, anything like that. But uh, so they kept on working and everybody that was working on trying to elucidate the structure of DNA continued to work. And so on one of their visits, uh, Watson and Crick went down to uh, King's College and they, uh, they began to visit with uh, uh, Rosalind Franklin. And uh, they were trying to see the uh, uh, pictures that she had, uh, her X-ray, diffraction pictures that she had had and she wouldn't let them see them. She, she didn't think they deserved to see anything and besides she had concluded that they were not very good scientists. They had no business in science. 
And so disappointed, Watson and Craig were walking out, and in the hallway they met Rosalind Franklin's boss, Dr. Wilkins. And uh, Dr. Wilkins said, hey, listen, step into my office and I have something to show you. He whipped out a picture that Rosalind Franklin had generated from, from DNA, uh, her work on uh, uh, DNA. And Dr. Craig, being a physicist, knew exactly what the structure should be from that picture. And so they went back and they proposed their model the uh, uh, DNA double helix and of course it was uh, published uh, I believe it was 1956 uh, in uh, on the uh, cover of nature and uh, they were they were very very popular but uh, Dr. Charkov and uh, Dr. Franklin were very bitter because they thought that these two did not deserve uh, uh, to uh, uh, to get the recognition for uh, elucidating the structure of DNA. Now, uh, if you don't remember the uh, basic structure of DNA, please go back and review it in uh, any uh, uh, basic textbook. But uh, uh, DNA consists of uh, uh, units of nucleotides, which are phosphate, deoxyribose, and nitrogen bases. Uh, they're linked by phosphodiester bonds. There are two strands that are running anti-parallel to each other. The nitrogen bases are numbered with normal numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and six, while the deoxyribose sugar is numbered with numbers containing prime, just to uh, uh, separate the two sets of numbers. And the double helix uh, uh, has uh, sugar and uh, phosphate backbones alternating sugar and phosphate backbones, nitrogen bases are oriented toward the center, and the DNA molecule is held together by weak uh, bonds called hydrogen bonds. And this is the structure you have on the right, the uh, picture of the DNA double helix right here, and then right here on the left, you've got the uh, structure where you have one strand that goes from five prime, three prime, and the other strand from five prime or three prime to five prime. You have the uh, deoxyribose and phosphate alternating uh, deoxyribose and phosphate, deoxyribose and phosphate on the backbone. And you have oriented to the center are the bases where A pairs with T with two hydrogen bonds and G bears with C uh, with uh, three hydrogen bonds. And so this is the basic structure of DNA.